was for leucine, not losers. So it's day three of 20 days of amino acids, and today we're talking about the amino acid leucine. Um, and so amino acids are protein letters. They have this generic carboxyl part and amino part. These They use this generic part to link together into chains, um, and then those chains fold up to give you a protein. In addition to the generic part, um, each amino acid has like uh, there are unique side chains or R groups that stick off, and so there are 20 different um, common ones you'll find in your proteins, um, and they have different properties that are going to influence the final properties of the protein because proteins are going to have different combos of them. Um, so today we are going to talk about leucine, which has this isobutyl group. So it's got Yesterday we looked at valine where it just had this V sticking straight off of this like central alpha carbon. Here with leucine we have another carbon in between. This is going to do a couple things as we'll see. It's going to push the bulk away from the center and make it a little more flexible. But you're also adding more um, hydrocarbon character. So you're adding more hydrophobicity. Um, so it's going to be avoided by the water even more than what we saw with valine. Leucine is also one of the two amino acids that is strictly ketogenic. Um, as opposed to glucogenic. And so we're going to talk about what this means. Um, and don't worry, I'm not trying to like sell you a fad diet or anything. Um, as we'll see, all these molecules can be like totally like interconverted between each other usually. Um, and it's just how the different pathways are used and where like the net energy production is going and where like the carbon skeleton is going and stuff. Um, so it's, it can get kind of confusing with the terminology. Um, it kind of depends on the perspective you're looking at. Um, but we call leucine ketogenic, which means that it can be, um, it's like breakdown products can be used to generate these things called ketone bodies, um, which are like an alternative source of fuel, or they can be used for lipidogenesis. So, um, the, the, the breakdown products can be used for lipidogenesis, so like making lipids, so like fats and that sort of thing. But that doesn't mean that amino acids that are glucogenic are the ones that can be used directly to make sugar. Those can also be like, the sugar can be used to make fat and there's all this stuff. So it's like all this inner conversion. So don't think that like if you just eat ketogenic amino acids that you are going to make a bunch of fat. And if you only eat non-ketogenic amino acids, you're just gonna make a lot of glucose. Um, that's not really how it works. So ketone bodies are also like the breakdown products of lipids. Um, so you typically hear about ketone bodies in the context of like lipids. And so you might think like, oh, like if something is ketogenic, that means it's going to make me burn fat. Um, so that is not what we're talking about here. Let's look at though at what these differences are. So day four of 20 days of amino acids and we're at leucine. And so you can say that we've been gradually getting a little bigger, but we're still staying in this aliphatic class where we have just the hydrocarbon um, backbone. So yesterday we looked at valine and it had this isopropyl group. So propyl is referring to that there's like three carbons. Um, this is an isobutyl group. Um, so it has four carbons and the iso is just because it has this carbon like branched here. Um, but don't confuse leucine with isoleucine, um, which we will look about at tomorrow. Um, and so just so I don't keep you waiting. So isoleucine, you're going to have the branching at um, branching closer to the um, to the backbone. So, but with leucine, what you see is that compared to valine, which we looked at yesterday. So we saw how valine has its branch. So these are all branch chains amino acids. These three because they have this branching in their chain. So valine had its branching really close to the backbone, and so this made it hard to rotate. So the peptide bonds that the amino acids are linked up to, they already restrict the motion because this peptide bond um, is resonance stabilized. So this has like a partial double bonded character between both the oxygen and the nitrogen and the carbon. Um, so although we typically draw it with the, um, the double bond to the oxygen, this is really resonance stabilized and you have this like electron sharing throughout the here. So this has a double bond character throughout. And when you have a double bond, you can't really rotate around it. Um, and so you can't rotate around this peptide bond, like inside the peptide bond, but you can rotate on either side of them. But how far you can rotate is going to depend on these R groups and like how bulky and stuff they are. Are they restricting the motion because you don't want to like clash into each other if you're trying to rotate. Um, and so we saw with valine that it was really hard for 
um, the backbone to rotate. And so it was, you wouldn't find it in like alpha helices where it requires these uh, specific angles around that bond uh, because valine was too bulky. Um, but we can see with leucine, even though it's longer, um, so even though like size wise, it's bigger than, um, bigger than valine, because it has this bulk, um, because it has its bulk kind of pushed out, um, as opposed to baling, which had its bulk um, close to the backbone, this is going to give it a little more flexibility. And so now you can find it in like alpha helices and stuff, um, which are those, um, these pretty like coily things you'll see in um, protein structures. So that is one thing that makes leucine different from um, valine. However, similarly to valine, it is hydrophobic. And actually, it's more hydrophobic than valine because a consequence of adding those extra hydrogens and carbons is that you're increasing the um, hydrophobicity because each of these hy this hydrocarbon group is hydrophobic. And so we talked a lot more about hydrophobicity yesterday, but just to review. So basically atoms, so all of these different, um, all the different connections between those balls in my model and the, like, so all of these oxygen, carbon, hydrogens, these are all joined together through these covalent bonds, which involve sharing pairs of electrons. So each of these atoms is made up of smaller parts. Um, so these subatomic particles, and so there's these positively charged protons, um, and they're held together tightly in the nucleus by these neutral neutrons. Um, so you have this dense central core in this nucleus um, that's kind of like held in place. And then you have this cloud of these negatively charged electrons whizzing around. And um, so you can think of atoms as like owning a certain amount of electrons, but the electrons that are farthest away from that like protons pole, so these electrons kind of like on the edge of the cloud, these valence electrons, um, they feel that pole less, um, that positive, the charge, charge pole. Um, so they're a little more promiscuous and they can actually like team up with the electron clouds from other atoms, um, kind of like merge their clouds and form bonds. And so we talk about like a single bond being sharing of single pair of electrons and a double bond being a uh, sharing of two pairs of electrons, but you can really think of them as kind of like merging these electron clouds. Um, and the way reason why it helps to think of them as like these merging these clouds instead of just like those dot models um, is because when they're sharing, they're not always sharing fairly. Um, so when you have, for example, an oxygen bound to hydrogen, so the oxygen is what we call electronegative. So when it's bound to um, things, it's going to be pulling on that elect those electrons. So the cloud in the cloud of electrons, those shared electrons. So those two that we, or the four, like the two with the hydrogens, or the four when we're doing a double bond to oxygen or to carbon. In that case, those shared electrons, so they're supposed to be shared, right? But the shared electrons are hanging out more with the oxygen because the oxygen is going to be like pulling them closer. Um, and so it's going to make the oxygen partly negative because those electrons are um, negative and because the, remember, the protons are set in place, they can't move, the electrons can move though. And so the electrons are going to hang out more with the oxygen. This is going to pull the electrons away from the hydrogens. The hydrogens still have their protons, so they're going to be partly positive and the oxygen is partly negative. You get the separation of charge we call polarity. Um, and because you have these oppositely charged parts, even though the molecule is neutral overall, you have these oppositely charged parts and then you can have charge, partial, charge, partial charge attractions and then water can form these networks. Other atoms, however, share fairly. Um, and so carbon and hydrogen are examples of this fair sharing. And so when they're sharing electrons, the electrons they share are actually like kind of shared fairly. So you don't get this, um, this separation of charge. Um, and so if you don't have this separation of charge, then there's nothing partially charged for the water to hang out with. And so the water is going to basically exclude those things. So the water is going to form these networks. And if you stick a hydrophilic thing in there, so something that has like a partial charge or a full charge, then the water is okay with hanging out with it because it can orient itself to put its partial charge and to hang out with those partial or full charges. But if you stick in something hydrophobic, so something that doesn't have something nonpolar, something that doesn't have any like partial or even full or full or even partial charges, 
then these molecules, these hydrophobic things, the water's not going to want to hang out with them. So the water is going to exclude them, kind of like cinch around them. So the water is trying to form these water water networks. This is going to force the hydrophobic things to gather together. When you have this happening in a protein, this can be like the driving force of the protein folding, because if you have, so as the protein is getting made, it's like this chain is exiting the ribosome. Um, so the protein making complex and you have these like hydrophobic residues coming out um, and facing this watery environment, they're going to help like drive the protein to fold so that those hydrophobic parts are protected in the center of the protein. Sometimes they actually need a little help. So they're like chaperone proteins that can help kind of like keep them sheltered until the rest of the protein comes out, or at least the part of the protein that they need to um, hang out with comes out. Um, so yeah, so because, so you'll see that these hydrocarbon, these um, amino acids with these hydrocarbon chains tend to be hydrophobic. And so leucine is here um, in this hydrophobic, very hydrophobic category because it's side chain is just these carbons and these hydrogens, which is pretty blah. Um, and so, yeah, so we call these, um, these are aliphatic because they just have these hydrocarbon chains that aren't rings. So this is going to be, we'll see like, this is an aromatic. Um, it has this hydrocarbon chain, but you have this resonance stabilized ring, whereas these are just like chains. So we call them aliphatic. Leucine, um, like valine we saw yesterday, leucine is essential um, in the dietary sense, which means that we can't make it ourselves. We need it from our food. So you're not going to see it on this chart of non-essential amino acid synthesis because it is essential. It is um, also what we call um, ketogenic. In fact, it's one of the two amino acids, the other being lysine, that is strictly ketogenic. Um, and so with ketogenic and glucogenic, the terms can get really um, confusing and confused. Um, so basically a glucogenic amino acid, when you break it down, so when you catabolize it, so we talk about metabolism and metabolism, metabolism is the making and breaking of molecules. Anabolism is the making of molecules. Catabolism is the breakdown of molecules. So when we talk about amino acid catabolism, we're talking about taking amino acids like from our food or whatever and breaking them down um, for energy. When we talk about like anabolism, we're talking about we can like use those parts to make things instead of just getting energy out of them. Um, so when we talk about glucogenic amino acids, these are amino acids that can be used like kind of directly, not directly, but they, they break down products can be used to generate a net gain of sugar. Um, so glucose is like blood sugar. So glucogenic um, making sugar, sugar making. So there's this tricarboxylic acid cycle or this TCA cycle. Um, we talked about it when we talked about cellular respiration how from like gl glucose, you can break that down into this pyruvate, which can get oxidized um, to oxaloacetate into the citric acid cycle, which is the TCA or the Krebs cycle. There's different names for it. Um, and then that can be broke, generate these electron carriers that can be used to make energy and give you this big payoff in oxidative phosphorylation. So the part that we're going, that we're looking at um, in, that, in the diagram I just showed you is a citric acid cycle. So here we're showing the citric acid cycle in its role as kind of like breaking down the products um, to generate these um, electron carriers for oxidative phosphorylation, which is where you get the big payout. But the, ox um, the oxaloacetate that you get from this TCA cycle, um, that's like kind of the end product of this TCA cycle, um, as well as like one of the inputs, because it's kind of like, it's a cycle. Um, but this oxaloacetate can also be used to make glucose. Um, so basically, if you put anything, if you make an amino acid into the product, a product that is in this TCA cycle, then this can be used to generate the oxaloacetate, which can be used to make glucose. So amino acids that directly can be converted or like, not like directly, directly, but can be easily converted. Um, some, so amino acids that can be converted into one of these um, TCA cycle components can also be used to make glucose. Um, so they can get broken down, just be used for making energy, or they can be used to make glucose. And so we call them glucogenic. 
you can, so the ones that are in blue are strictly glucogenic. Um, you also see that, so some of them can be made into pyruvate. Um, and so pyruvate also counts, if you make, can make pyruvate, we also call you glucogenic because this pyruvate can be made to make acetyl-CoA and can be made to make, used to make oxaloacetate depending on which pathway you go. Um, and so since you're generating these intermediates of the QCA, then you can be used to make glucose. So what about ketogenic? So ketogenic, um, so these amino acids are things that give you, um, they give you acetoacyl-CoA or acetyl-CoA. Um, and these can be used to make lipids um, or they can be alternatively, they can be for the like energy breakdown typically. So you can use them to make lipids or you can use them um, to make these ketone bodies. Um, so lipids are like these um, really, our lipids are like fats and oils and all this stuff. And they're very hydrophobic. And so they're not going to be able to travel like through your bloodstream easily, but these ketone bodies can. So under conditions where there is not enough like sugar um, being um, sugar to break down, what's going to happen is you're not going to generate enough of this oxaloacetate. So in order to make this citrate in this pathway, basically the entry into this TCA cycle is this acetyl-CoA, but it has to join up with an oxaloacetate. And so this oxaloacetate is coming like from, it comes like out at the end of the cycle um, and joins with this acetyl-CoA to keep cycling. But if you're taking this oxaloacetate out of the pathway, so we're showing you this is a cycling, but we also said that oxaloacetate could be taken out of the pathway to make glucose and stuff. And so if you don't have enough sugar, if you're using these intermediates, um, you're not going to have enough to fuel this pathway. And if you don't have enough to fuel this pathway, what's going to happen is that you can't, even if you make acetyl-CoA, you can't like, you don't have the oxalic acetate you need to really get this uh, moving to make more glucose, to keep this moving. So what's going to happen is that alternatively, So if you don't have enough oxaloacetate, what can happen is that the cycle can't keep going. And if the cycle can't get going, you not only can you not make glucose, but you can't get that big energy payout. So if you need energy, but you don't have enough sugar, what you can do is these ketogenic amino acids, they can take this acetyl acetyl K away and they can actually convert it into these ketone bodies. So basically with acetyl acetate, you're joining together two of these acetyl acetyl CoA's, um, losing that CoA part. Um, beta hydroxybutyrate, this is where this gets um, reduced. Um, so you can see that you want here from a double bond to an O to a single bond to an oxygen. Um, and then with acetone, this is like a spontaneous breakdown uh, product, product of these. Um, so these ketone bodies, um, these, they have these oxygen, this ketone is like a carbon next to two, with double bonded to an oxygen, so carbonyl carbon with carbons on either side. Uh, because you have this oxygen group, you're introducing this polar quality into this molecule. And so now it can travel through the bloodstream to other tissues. Um, and then those tissues can use them, convert them back into um, like acetyl-CoA, and then that can enter this cycle to be used. So if those other tissues have enough oxaloacetate, um, then they can use these ketone bodies to generate energy. And this allows you to make um, energy from these ketone bodies and these ketone bodies, I should say. Um, so we typically think of them as being made from lipids, um, but they can also be made from amino acids. But so when your body is like burning fat and stuff, um, they can generate these ketone bodies that can then travel to the tissues that need them um, and be used to generate energy. Um, so what, hap what can happen is that if you might've heard of like, Ket ketosis. Um, so this can happen in people with like diabetes um, and or like ketoacidosis. Um, so this can happen in people with like diabetes. So in diabetes, they have um, problems either making or like they're responding to insulin, which is a molecule that tells your cells to like take in glucose um, and among other things. And so if you don't have insulin working properly, um, kind of like insulin's like 
um, opposite kind of like glucagon. It's this other hormone. Um, so it's going to tell your body like, hey, we don't have enough sugar. So let's just like, let's start breaking down this lipid. Um, and so if they start breaking down this lipid, um, then what can happen is you can get um, a lot of ketone bodies produced. And you'll see that these, these ketone bodies have this carboxylic acid group. And so this can actually acidify the blood um, and so cause like a low pH. Um, and so that's why we call it ketoacidosis. Um, this acetone product can also um, work not to give you like this like fruity smell. Um, and so that's why sometimes like ketoacid ketosis can be um, like suspected or diagnosed um, based on like people, doctors will say, oh, there was a fruity smell to their breath or whatever. So that's where the whole ketosis thing comes in. So that is why we call some of these amino acids ketogenic. And so with some of them, the ones in purple are both ketogenic and um, glucogenic because they can be made into pre um, to products of this like TCA cycle and the propyrubate, or they can be made into acetyl, acetyl CoA or acetyl CoA. Um, and so those would be both. So when we talk about leucine, leucine is only, gluco is only ketogenic. Um, so you might be wondering, okay, so I see leucine being made into this acetyl-CoA, and you said acetyl-CoA goes into this pathway, and this pathway gives you oxaloacetate, which can be made from glucose, right? So the thing is, when you put in this acetyl-CoA, you have to join it up with an oxaloacetate in order to like form the citrate to make the cycle good work. So even though if you're making this acetyl-CoA, you still need an oxaloacetate. And so you can use acetyl-CoA to make oxaloacetate, but then you're using the oxaloacetate you just made to basically make the oxaloacetate you just made. Um, so basically, this you're not getting a net, net gain of um, glucose, so we don't call it glucogenic. So in order to call something glucogenic, it has to make like a product that's like already in the cycle. Um, and so pyruvate will count though, because it can make these acetyl-CoA and oxaloacetate. But if you only make like acetyl-CoA or um, then you can't, um, you can't um, get like a net gain from this, um, from this pathway. You can't get like a net gain of oxaloacetate from this pathway. That's it's the oxaloacetate that then can go it off and make the glucose making. So leucine is considered ketogenic only. So how exactly does this get um, broken down? Um, so like the other branch chain amino acids, it goes through this like branch chain amino acid transferase. Um, where it has its amino group removed, um, and then this branch chain alpha keto acid dehydrogenase complex. Um, and so with, with leucine, what you're going to end up with is isovaleryl CoA, acetyl CoA, and acetyl acetate. And so remember, um, acetyl acetate is one of these ketone bodies. Um, acetyl CoA, we saw it here. Um, and so that's why this, um, these can then be used as ketogenic. So overall, it looks something like this. So you take this leucine, you take this amino group. Um, so this is the first step of like any um, getting, breaking down any amino acid, you just need to get rid of that amino group um, and you wanna do it safely um, without generating like ammonia and stuff throughout your body. Um, so this amino group gets transferred to alpha ketoglutarate, um, also called 2-oxoglutarate. Um, and so this is done with this BCAT we talked about, um, and that gives you glutamate and this branch chain alpha keto acid. Um, so ketone, remember, a carbon with double bonds with oxygen um, next to two other carbons. Um, and so this is going to be this alpha keto isocaproic acid in this case. Um, and then that can then uh, be broken down further um, to give you isovaleryl CoA. Um, then that can be broken down further, acetoacetyl-CoA, acetyl-CoA, and then ketone bodies or lipids. Um, and so that is why we call this um, ketogenic. So you can see that its products are being used that way. What about valine? So yesterday we talked about valine and you can see that valine, it can be used to make um, succinyl-CoA. Um, and succinyl-CoA can be used to make glucose. 
So valine, unlike um, so unlike leucine, valine is glucogenic. So it's being broke. Its breakdown product is giving it the succinyl CoA, which is a can, which is directly in this pathway, and therefore we call it glucogenic because it can be used to go and make glucose. Um, so it's not coming in at this in this ketogenic -y stuff. It's coming in in, in the glucosey stuff, and so we call it glucogenic. As for the discovery, um, so it was first isolated in an uncured state by Proust, um, who was trying to study why different types of cheese tasted different. Um, then in 1820, Henry Brackenot, Brackenot, um, so this is the guy who found glycine. Um, he isolated it from acid hydrolysis of mustard fiber and wool. And he called it light leucine because it was a white crystalline substance and loop means white. Um, and so I'm not in the lab today where I would show you what leucine um, powder looks like, what that crystalline powder looks like, but I'm not um, there today, so I can't, so sorry.